Welcome everybody. Every year we provide an update on the state of the German internet. Usually we do it on the big stage at the OMR festival. This year for the second time in a row we do it by video me sitting here at our signature desk. So what's going on on the German internet? Maybe take a first look at the German internet index. Something we created a couple of years ago and every year we do an update. So in the past year the Publicly listed German digital companies, they increased in value from 72 billion to 109 billion. So it was a good year for publicly listed German internet stocks. Same thing, by the way, for European internet stocks. They grew from 2080 billion in market cap to almost 400 billion. So it's also an uplift of around 40%. Then take a look out east, China, the uplift was not that big. I mean, the level is a bigger one, and there's only three companies involved, um, Alibaba, Baidu, Tencent. But the reason why they didn't grow that much, even though there was corona, is that the, there's a lot of fear um, of reg uh, regulation in China. So the uplift is investors are more, care more careful, a little more hesitant to invest big in already ex very expensive Chinese stocks. And then there's the GAFA companies, the American companies, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple. This is just an incredible level they have already. Um, and they've increased on this major level again by almost 40%. This shows in my eyes the global relevance and dominance those platforms have. And to underline this relevance a little bit, I would like to show you some examples of what's going on and how powerful these companies are. One example I like to use is the Apple AirPods. Last year I showed that the revenue Apple generates with the AirPods alone is 20 billion. And that is more than Red Bull and Puma and um, Bose, the European companies, have in revenue combined. But it's also, and that is new, more than the most famous digital platforms that are not Apple, Google, Facebook, and Apple. For instance, Snapchat, Twitter, and Spotify together, they don't even reach the revenue level that Apple has only with its AirPods. And then on the Amazon side, there's another example of dominance. Amazon every day adds another 400 million in GMV, in gross merchandise volume. That's an extra 400 million every day. By the way, that equals the yearly, the yearly revenue that's happening in retail on Monkebergstraße in Hamburg. So the Monkebergstraße, the Hamburg Champs-Élysées, the Hamburg Broadway has in revenue equal to what Amazon adds every day. Or, in a different way, um, we could look at it as a Pac-Man scheme, and Pac-Man eats a Mönckebergstraße every day. Having said that, let's take a look at those winners in digital the past year. There's obviously, I just mentioned that, the big four, GAFA, they add almost 40% in value. And there's this lady, Kathy Woods. She, with her ARK investment family, the ARK investment funds, the ETFs called ARK, they added 80%. And that includes a recent downturn um, in, the, in the past weeks, once the digital hype was already um, through a little bit. They lost, but still, the past 12 months, 80% plus. And then we have single stocks. Obviously, Peloton, Tesla did really well. They both, for instance, added over 100% each. And on the second spot in the digital winners list are the cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin added 240%. And the mysterious Dogecoin, a fun currency that wasn't even meant to be serious, thanks to Elon Musk, they added 12,700% this past year. Don't bet on this being sustainable, but that's the way it is right now. And in the number one spot of our digital winners list for the last 12 months is this guy, a guy by the name of Mike Winkelmann. He's from Wisconsin. And he's a digital artist. He produces NFTs, non-fungible tokens. And his most recent, most valuable piece was called The First 5,000 Days. It looks like this and sold for $70 million, but was paid for in Ether. And including the recent Ether uplift, now the whole piece is worth over $100 million. That makes him the most valuable artist alive across all genres. For example, Jeff Koons, 
a name you might know, has sold his most valuable piece for 90 million. After so much talk about digital winners, there's one obvious question, and that is, who are the digital losers of the last 12 months? And we took a careful look around, but we couldn't find that many. Even companies that seemed destined to be losers in those corona times, Airbnb, Booking, Trivago, they didn't lose, they all gained value. You could maybe argue that German business networking platform Zing or United Internet from Germany, they have lost a little bit of their value, but you can't really call them losers. All this talk of growth and additional value leads to one basic question in my mind, and that is, how is value generated in the first place? And there's only one answer. It's either through bundling or through unbundling. Let me explain to you what I mean by that. And I want to use a very current example. There's banks. That's what a bank in Germany looks from the inside. And they offer different services. They have a portfolio of different services. And now here come digital companies that break out certain services. For instance, this lady here, she might be busy with a checkings account. And now the whole checkings service is taken care of by digital companies. They do nothing but checking. That's companies like Revolut, Tomorrow, Monzo, N26. All billion dollar companies. And then here's this, guy, uh, this lady. She might be paying, with some, paying for something. And also the payment, the service here, is broken out out of the current, the traditional banking infrastructure, and now being taken care of by digital $100 billion companies like Apple Pay, PayPal, or Square. And then we have this guy. He might be paying for something with his credit cards. Also, this service is now being taken care of by Klarna, by Affirm, by PaySafe. So piece by piece, the banking landscape gets unbundled. Pieces get broken out of it. Last but not least, maybe this guy here. He might be trading, might be buying stock. And also this service, very specialized service, is now being um, fulfilled by companies such as eToro, Robinhood, Scalable, Trade Republic, all again billion dollar companies that create value by unbundling what banks did before. A good example for bundling, on the other hand, is Amazon. There's so many services Amazon adds almost every week and look at how the value of Amazon grew from all these new offers they added. And by the way, even digital companies they are not immune from unbundling. You could argue that right now it's happening to Google. All e-commerce searches that used to happen on Google now tend to happen on Amazon. That's part of an unbundling that's happening. Also, all travel and flight related searches that used to happen on Google get unbundled and they move into a new bundle. They move into the booking bundle. So this is the whole fight for value creation is usually bundling and unbundling. Now, from the theory to the practical, like every year, let me break down six very operational stories that you can apply it for your project, for your company, tomorrow. And the best thing, for you, all free on YouTube. Let's go. Operational tactic number one is about a question I guess asked quite a lot. And this question is usually raised by producers or brands. They all want to become direct-to-consumer brands. They want to work directly with their customers. And this is why we try to deconstruct the playbooks and the strategies of very successful direct-to-consumer brands. Let me just go back. This is how it usually happened. There's a brand or producer. He goes through retail. He sells to his consumers. And now this model is broken up, and brands try desperately to sell directly to their consumers. That creates a couple of benefits for them. For instance, better profit margins, direct relationships, and in the end also brand and image control. Who does this perfectly? There's the example of Nike. They started first, and once they announced in 2017 that they would now go direct to consumer, the stock price increased quite a bit. Look at this. But also outside from superstar brands like Nike, there's companies that you can learn from quite a bit. For instance, there's Canyon, a European bicycle brand, now valued at more than one billion. Or there's a whole group of brands called Invincible Brands. Brands like Hello Body are part of this, usually uh, recently acquired for over 300 million euros. And then there's from the UK, Gymshark, uh, a gymwear brand 
valued at 1.3 billion. They all provide a very technical, a very operational insight into how a direct-to-consumer brand is built. Chapter one of our direct-to-consumer playbook is about building a community. Make no mistake, there are sometimes cases of brands that are created because people and founders had the community already. Don't be sad comparing yourself. You need to build a community no matter what. And usually what happens is, companies come out of existing communities. People are close to athletes, to other people in a certain tribe. And then they build products. That happened with Kenyan. They were very close to those influencers, to the most relevant people in this community. You have to try to mimic this. You have to also probably create content. When we look at Hello Body, for instance, what they did is they, do, they put a lot of passion into their content, and that delivers results. Also, we believe you need to establish an offline connection. There's so much relevance in online, that's obvious, but also you have to take people around the world on a tour. You have to really be present offline with your community. Gymshark does that. And then one thing, maybe the thing I found most impressive is how intense you have to interact with your community. That's the example of the German um, streetwear brand, 6PM, and the founder, he recently told me on my podcast how many hours and how many DMs in a day he sends. And it's a, it's a couple thousand every day with his community. This is what it looks like at 6 p.m. He's all the time in touch with his people. And then once he has stuff to drop or once he has stuff to, to sell, they are there. Second chapter in the playbook is about sharpening your product. What do I mean by sharpening a product? Um, let me use the example of Veja, a new kind of sneaker. And what makes this sneaker so successful? It's not the technical aspect of the shoe, not the shoe design. It's the story behind the shoe. They produce an organic, a vegan shoe. Nobody had heard of a vegan shoe before. And then Veja came up with the story of a vegan shoe. And that story clicked and connected with so many people. And this sharpened their product. Obviously, once you create special editions, you have something special. You have a very sharpened product. And also, if you have, a, if you have scarcity, if you limit your products, they become more and more special and the product is more sharp. Next chapter in the book is about pushing consumers into your properties. What do I mean by that? Obviously, you need stores. You need the physical touch points with your users. That can be stores, but once you go for stores, you have to make sure they are personal, they are full of passion, and they really embody what you want to stand for. They're not just stores somewhere. That's your store with your spirit. And then last but not least, once you have a certain size and the highway of building um, or pushing people into your properties is obviously your own app. Huh? Nike does that. It's not easy. It's not for everybody. But that's what the best players in D2C are able to do. And fourth chapter is about tech and tools. You need to create your own tech stack with your own tools. I'm not saying create and write your own code, but identify the tools that help you become a direct-to-consumer brand. How do you do that? That's easy. There's a software, there's a web solution called Build With, and you look up what already successful companies do and tools they use. We did that. We started with Nike, and here, look at the Nike web shop, and we looked up with Build With which tools they use. This is the set of the tech stack, if you want, that Nike um, employs. And now we've categorized this tech stack into three categories. The first category is shop tech, and those are the shop tech tools we came across quite a bit when researching the most successful D2C brands. Those are the MarTech tools we saw, and those here are the content tech tools we saw. By the way, all those software, all those tools, you can look at them individually and read about what other users have to say about them on our software review platform, OMR Reviews. So let me briefly, briefly summarize the D2C playbook. Four chapters. It's, the first one is about building a community. The second one is about sharpening your product. The third one is about pushing customers into your properties. And the fourth one is about your own proprietary tech stack. The number two operational insight this year is about a phenomenon you've heard before, but I find it very important for our times. You see it everywhere. It's called the creator economy. And it's about people like her. 
Her name is Kylie Jenner. She's followed by 240 million people worldwide. And that translates directly into brand equity, into brand reach. Her own cosmetics brand, Kylie Cosmetics, is already followed by 25 million people. And that creates more searches for Kylie Cosmetics than there are for traditional brands such as Chanel. And also, that creates enterprise value, obviously. It has been re recently realized in 2019, Kylie sold her company for over half a billion to Coty. Another example is this guy, very successful YouTuber, but his best business is happening outside of YouTube. On YouTube, he's followed by 60 million people. And what does he do with that? He creates his own burger chain, 300 restaurants across America, but he's not doing it by himself. He's doing it in a partnership. And in this case, the 300 restaurants are opened in partnership with a guy named Robert Earl, who's also the founder of Planet Hollywood. And they together managed to push um, the Mr. Beast Burger app to the number one spot on the app charts and created this burger business with one million sandwiches sold in the first two months alone. So this is what you do with your reach today. You don't sell advertising, you create businesses. A third international example is this eight-year-old kid, another YouTuber. His name is Ryan Kanji, and he's very good with toys, and that converts into a toy business. 30 million followers on YouTube, and then a partnership with Bonkers, the toy retailer, led to 170 million in retail sales alone with Ryan's products. So who does that in Germany? One example is the e-commerce giant About You. They partner with fashion influencer Lena Gerke, and together they came up with a new brand called Leger. In the past three years, together About You and Lena, they sold products for over 50 million. Another German example is a food company called Hey. They sell protein bars, and they do that very successfully, but even more successfully in co-creation with Pamela Reif, the largest German fitness and health um, influencer. Together, they created their own brand, Naturally Pam, and they created more followers for the Naturally Pam account than they have already for the Hey account. Last German example for the creator economy is coming from Osterburken a small town somewhere in Baden-Württemberg. You've never heard of this, but they have this factory here. And what do they do there? They usually produce juice, juice by the brand Dietz. And now they've teamed up with this guy, the most successful German rap star, Capital Bra or Kapi. And together they created Bra Tee, his own tea. And what did that translate into? It translated into six million sold tea units in the first two months of its existence. Cheers. The operational insight number three is called the metaverse. What is that? It's basically virtual universes where people live. Right now, it's mostly games. Games such as Fortnite or Roblox. Just to demonstrate the sheer size of these platforms, look at those numbers. On Fortnite, there's 350 million accounts. On Roblox, there's over 200 million people active every month. What are these games doing now? They're becoming platforms. Look at, for instance, what's happening on Fortnite. There's one thing called party mode, where weapons don't work anymore. You stop playing and just hang out there with your friends on Fortnite. Party time. And also, you watch movies there, not just any movies. Chris Nolan movies are launched on Fortnite. Or you visit concerts there. There's the example of Roblox, where Lil Nas X performed exclusively for the Roblox audience. Or Travis Scott performed on Fortnite. And then people create fashion items there, stuff they like. They just produce it there directly inside the platform. Or, and that's probably the craziest of all, during the pandemic, people couldn't gather in real life, so they got married on the platform, but with real life consequences. So this leads to one central question for brands. How do you get access to this new world? I have a couple examples for you. First is a fashion brand called Valentino. And this is a girl in a Valentino dress. And they came up with the idea of bringing this dress into the Animal Crossing game. 
And how did they do that? They asked influencers to replicate the dress inside of Animal Crossing and then promote this dress on their Instagram accounts. Another option is to go game in game. I'm thinking of the example of Warner Brothers. They have their movie, Wonder Woman 84, launched in Roblox. How did they do that? They built a Wonder Woman world inside of Roblox and that delivered 25 million impressions. Just to put that into perspective, the most important channel to launch movies these days is probably YouTube. And for the same movie, they created 40 million views on YouTube. So over two thirds of the views they got on YouTube were already established or already achieved inside of Roblox. And the third metaverse option, my favorite option, a gorilla option was recently employed by Burger King. It started with them partnering with a fourth tier British soccer team called Stevenage FC. Why would a global brand such as Burger King sponsor a fourth division football team? The reason is it wasn't meant for the real world, it was meant for the digital world. Stevenage FC is a team that you can play with on FIFA inside the game. And when you played there, Burger King incentivized you to play with them and to score goals with them. For every scored goal with Stevenage FC, they would give you a free burger. Obviously, millions of people like to do that, and Stevenage FC became a thing inside of FIFA. And people even put world famous soccer players in their Stevenage teams. In the end, we had Lionel Messi, Cristiano Ronaldo play Stevenage FC. So with this guerrilla tactic, Burger King achieved over 1.2 billion impressions for their jersey sponsoring inside of FIFA. It's beyond comparison to what they would have to pay in the real world to achieve the same. Let me summarize the three most important metaverse advertising options. The first is about virtual skins and items, then there's game in game experiences, and the third of course is guerrilla marketing. Tactic number four. We call it the streaming effect. And what is meant by this? It's about the cultural influence Netflix has and how to ride those waves. Let me first explain to you what Netflix means these days. Once the new series is launched on Netflix, in the first 28 days after launch, sometimes over 80 million people watch that series. That happened with Bridgerton. Or The Witcher. Over 70 million people watched this series after it launched in the first four weeks. Same with Lupin, or with Money Heist, or with Tiger King. And now, what are the options that brands have to profit from that? First, it's the obvious, you have to co cooperate with those Netflix brands. For instance, there's a Netflix brand called Stranger Things, also a very successful series, and they partnered with everybody in the business. Coca-Cola, Nike, Lego, Levi's, they all did official partnerships with Stranger Things and profited from the Netflix effect. But then there's other ways to profit that are not so official. There's, for instance, eBay trends that you can observe. When Bridgerton came out, the search volume on eBay for corsets exploded. Also, we saw more search for afternoon tea set, or we saw a lot of search for Visteria plants, whatever that is. 300% more search volume. The best way, in my mind, to profit from that is to go on a platform called Etsy. This is where people sell their handmade stuff. And when a Bridgerton keyword delivers over 10,500 results, it might be a good idea to be one of those results. Being one of those results means selling a t-shirt, selling a cup of tea, selling an item that's somehow connected to Bridgerton. And that means a lot of attention and a lot of demand. For instance, this small shop that sold a Bridgerton t-shirt sold over 40,000 items. Another example, a little closer to home, this is my old colleague Fleming, and he recently started his own fashion brand called Inferno Ragazzi. They sell stuff like this, crazy products, and the way he now rides the Netflix wave, waves is like this. He notices there's a new very successful series coming out on Netflix, Tiger King in this case, and here it is, the Tiger King themed Inferno Ragazzi t-shirt. There's only one left, XS. That's all I need.
And now this one is sold out too. What did Fleming do when he saw that there was this huge series about Michael Jordan on Netflix, The Last Dance? He accordingly produced a t-shirt when he saw that Daft Punk broke up, another cultural shockwave. He produced a t-shirt for that. In the end, even Netflix themselves, they recognized what's happening and just recently communicated that they're now opening a shop to sell these types of products. Tactic number five, embedded content. While casual content marketing is a little overplayed, the next level shit is embedded content. What do I mean by that? First, the basic struggle is the same. Buying keywords on Google is painfully expensive. For instance, if you buy the keyword sports bets or online casino, you pay around 40 or 50 euros for every single click. So a solution for that that I really liked is um, what we saw when we looked at the American casino operator, Penn National. How did they solve the problem? They decided to team up with an online publishing, a sports publishing website called Barstool Sports. And together they came up with a new app, a gaming, a betting app. And that app delivered in the first 10 days of existence almost 3 million in revenue. To put things a little into perspective, Penn National paid 150 million for 40% of Barstool. And Barstool came with 100 million monthly active users. To bring this back to our initial Google comparison, a user can be acquired through this merger for one euro and 50 cents. As you can imagine, Penn National shareholders were very happy about this decision. The stock price development of Penn National after the Barstool acquisition is quite successful. Another example of embedded content marketing can be found in the software sector. For instance, the term software email marketing, one click from this term costs you over 50 euros. So what did a company that is affected, such as HubSpot, HubSpot is one of the um, most successful marketing cloud software providers in the world, what did they do? They managed to sneak around Google by acquiring a business newsletter called The Hustle. The Hustle came with 1.5 million users and cost them 22 million to acquire. So if you put those figures back in the original equation, you get the following. You see that instead of acquiring a user for, 40, for 54 euros per click, you now pay 15 euros per user and you own the user. A third and more local example I like quite a bit is here the guys from Toman. They sell their music instruments quite successfully. Last year I talked about their review marketing and this year I want to show another tactic they used to defend themselves against Amazon. It's by acquiring content. One of the key challenges obviously is to fight back Bezos and the whole Amazon attacks. Amazon likes to sell music instruments as well. So what do the Toman guys do? They acquire content. They recently bought properties such as Musicaboard, Kopfhörer.de, DJ Lab, a couple others. So in the end, it's their way of defending themselves, of making themselves more relevant, buying content assets. That's a new way of life. The last but not least idea we had this year is called underpriced attention. What is meant by that? Similar to what we saw with Google, prices also increase on social media platforms. Here's a snapshot of what happened on Facebook and Instagram with their price for 1,000 impressions in the past years. In 2019, 1,000 impressions cost around 3, 3 euro and 80 cents. Then last year, over 4 euros. And now this year, we expect 1,000 impressions to cost around 4 euro and 60 cents. So prices go up. So how do marketeers solve that? We like the example of Stuart frying pans. They advertise like that on Facebook and use the very same advertisement on Reddit. On Facebook, they pay per 1,000 impressions 11 euro and 65 cents. And on Reddit, they pay 20 cents. Another example of a company that's really good at finding underpriced platforms is Ehrlich. They sell underwear and that's what their ads look like on Instagram and that is what their ads look like on Pinterest almost the very same ad. The only difference is very economic. 
on Instagram for 1,000 impressions, they pay a CPM of 8 euro. And on Pinterest, for even better, more conversion-likely traffic, they pay only 2.68 euro as the CPM. So it's, quite, it's such a better platform, such a better strategy to go to Pinterest and sell your product there right now. A last example comes from the video side. This guy here, a real estate consultant called Einfach Immo, he used to play out his videos on Facebook and then he switched the same videos over to TikTok. They look very similar, but while the videos look similar, the prices are completely not. On Facebook, for 1,000 impressions for his video, he paid 30 euros and 76 cents. And on TikTok, and that is shocking, for the same video, he's paying 66 cents only. So to wrap things up here, my advice is to look for tier two social platforms that still have hundreds of millions of users, but cost a lot less than the major platforms. So before we're done, here's my summary of this year's State of the German Internet keynote. First, think about the D2C playbook. Second, find your co-creator. Third, think about your way to access the metaverse. Third, respect the streaming effect. Fourth, embedded content. And sixth, look for underpriced attention on tier B platforms. Thank you very much for helping us make this happen to our major partners. Thank you very much to Vodafone, to Adobe, to Audi, to many other partners. And also, thank you very much to the city of Hamburg that helps us make this possible. Without you, it wouldn't be the same. This all also wouldn't be the same without a team. It's just me presenting here. There's so many people behind this presentation. Let me just name the most important ones. It's um, Fleming Peter, Torben Lux, Francesca Veit, Michael Wanka, Eike Dening, Roland Eisenbrand, Scott Peterson, Florian Heide, Christian Kors, Nina Schliefer, Martin Gard, and Sarah Heimburger. Thanks to the team. Thanks for everybody for listening. This was this year's State of the German Internet. See you next year on the big stage. <laughs>